welcome to this Enactus World Cup session on the future of food, a topic critical to, to us all before the pandemic and ever more so today. I'm Rachel Jarosh, President and CEO of Enactus, and I'm delighted to welcome our audience, all of you today, to join us and several esteemed guests who bring deep expertise driving meaningful efforts to create a healthier and more sustainable food system for all. Before we get started, we wanted to share with you a conversation I was privileged to have recently with Juan Luciano, the chair and CEO of ADM, on this vital topic. We'll start there, and then we'll move to a discussion with our esteemed panelists. Juan, it is such a pleasure to introduce you and welcome you to the Enactus World Cup and to introduce you to our students. As you know, thousands and thousands of them around the world partake in our program. Many of them are 19, 20, 21 years old. They are all undergraduates in college or university. Before we get started, I'd love to know, what were you thinking and doing at 19 and 20 years old? How were you thinking about your future? <laughs> well, thank you, Rachel, for the invitation. And uh, I certainly like the title World Cup because at that point in time, you know, I'm from Argentina. Between <laughs> my 18-year-old and my 26-year-old, we went World Cup champions of soccer twice. So <laughs> part of what I was doing at that time was celebrating our soccer successes, long time past and gone. Um, but I would say uh, I, I was probably not as inspiring as the youth of, that you face today, that I think that they have much more lofty goals. And, and I, I was uh, studying engineering at that point in time. Uh, I remember that the, the issues at the time was how we're going to do productivity in the world. And that's what we worry about. All these technologies, you know, telexes and telephones and telegraphs and all those things that were slowing us down and the paper office, you know, and all those things. And we were thinking if we can go to tiny particles like electrons, you know, uh, and, and bring that technology, that will bring productivity. So in my part time job, I had a part time job. I was a computer programmer at that point in time <laughs> in my life. And um, and I was dating the girl that is today my wife. And uh, my objective was to bring productivity in the world again as an engineer student and also make a living so I can marry Carolina, which I did. <laughs> so that was I was thinking at that age. Well, I would say that's a lot and great foresight as um, as everything that you studied then has brought about tremendous change since then yeah. and has brought you obviously to a full life, both uh, having married your sweetheart, but also leading the world's largest food and ingredient supplier. So when we talk about supply chain and access, there's much here for us to discuss. So let me ask you today in light of that. What, in your view, is the single greatest challenge in the food and agriculture space today? And why is this an important topic for the next generation of leaders to be thinking about and addressing today? Yeah, well, th this is so such a relevant uh, and important issue for the world today. And, and I think I'm so happy that the youth is focusing on this because we need this passion to solve this dilemma. First is the issue of food security. We are adding 2 billion people every 30 years to the world. So we've been doing that since I was born. So in 1960 to 1990, we added 2 billion, the next 30 years, 2 billion. And from now to 2050, we're going to add another 2 billion people. And we need to feed them not only quality material, but in a sustainable way. We know the carrying capacity of our planet is reaching its limit, and we need to be able to feed everybody with, with the planet we have. The other subject that is that is coming to, uh, to 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 bear here is the health and wellness issue. Not only we want to heal to to feed people in terms of quality protein and, or quality calories sustainably, but also this desire of health and wellness. Over the next five years, Rachel, for the first time in history, the population over 65 year old will be larger than the population under five. So that brings two issues. First of all, we're getting older. It's not only me, apparently, it's a bunch of people getting older with me. And, uh, and these people want to live healthier lives. And, and, and as they're gonna live longer lives, they want to add quality to those lives. And also there is a big tax here 
on the healthcare system in the world because the money is going to these five elements, uh, cancer treatments, Alzheimer disease, pain, diabetes, and heart disease. And we believe in ADM that nutrition has the power to solve some of these problems in the sense that if we uh, have a better diet for people, we can at least address the issues of heart disease or, or, or improve them and the issues of diabetes. And with that, we're going to allow maybe more money in the healthcare system to go and treat the things that we can't through better nutrition, like maybe Alzheimer's or cancer or pain. So, uh, so I think that when we look at that from our perspective, as you said, as one of the large uh, uh, um, food and science companies, if you will, we've been doing this for 118 years. So if you look at our purpose, which is they unlocked the power of nature to enrich the quality of life. You see here the whole, uh, in, in the whole sentence, if you analyze it, is we unlock the power of nature. So for us, in order to continue to unlock, we are close to nature and we need to respect nature. And then we focus on enriching lives. And lives around the world are at different stages. There are some affluent people that want to live longer and healthier lives. There are people that want to get access to basic nutrition. And we participate in the whole value chain across the world. So uh, this is the issue of our times. This is the issue of our times. Indeed, and I can share with you that many of our students obviously are very deeply engaged in this topic. We've just concluded our first ever Enactus exchange program between the US and Morocco. And in both countries, many students were focused on nutrition um, and healthy solutions uh, to both the needs of uh, those without access to food, but also those with access to food and a more sustainable and healthy approach to both. So tell me what that has meant for you and for ADM in light of COVID, in light of the pandemic. I know that consumers are changing their perception of sustainability in relation to food. What have you seen in your network, your clients and your customers, but also how is ADM thinking about that differently, if at all? Yeah, uh, it, it made all of us rethink everything, you know, and, and, and we've been very proud at ADM, Rachel, that even through the lockdowns, we've been able to keep every plant operating. We have more than 600 plants around the world in 160 countries, so we managed to keep them. That's why you continue to receive food every day. We have more than 200 ports that we operate around the world, and they've been able to export the materials you know, food is not equally distributed in the world with population. So the issue of being able to export food from places of surplus to places where they don't have it. I always said, for example, my country of Argentina, we have 40 million people, give or take, and we can produce food for 400 million. On the other hand, if you think about China, China has 22% of the world population, but only 6% of the arable land or 8% of the water. So they always going to be importing. So being able to manage ports and all that and that flux of product is critically important for the food supply chain. So I'm delighted that our team has been able to do that with with a lot of resilience and not only us, but also the whole the whole system. Um, of course, what you said is important that the behavior of the consumer has changed also during COVID. And, and I would say the biggest shock to the system was that change, was that change on demand. Mm -hmm. For the first time, we saw, we saw food services, so all the restaurants, all that, all the sporting events, all that almost disappeared overnight. And we needed, and then we saw retail, so people buying for the pantry, increase significantly. And we have to, to adjust that. Part of that adjustment was a product, you know, you, you, we, you, we, you consume more with home cooking and home baking. You consume more maybe flour. You consume more macaroni and cheese, but you consume much less shrimps, for example. Shrimp is something that you will eat it when you go out. So I'm, I'm just taking any example, but sure. some of those things shift significantly. Some oils that are used, for example, for frying products in, in, a, in a fast food restaurant it's not the same oil that you use to fry chips that you buy at home. So all those, the industry has, adjust, has to adjust to all those shifts in demand. And that was the biggest issue. It was a logistics 
of do you have the product in the right place? Are you making the right products? So it was a supply chain, but but the, the ability to produce and the ability to supply is very robust. And we saw two other things that people were are much more focused now with the pandemic in the health nature of the product that they consume. They are more mu much more mindful of what they are putting in their body and also the impact of what they are putting in their body has in the environment. So we've seen things that were uh, trying to accelerate like plant-based proteins become much more mainstream. We have seen the sales of, for, for example, probiotics or vitamins going up because people think about the in, in, immune system and how to reinforce their immune system. Uh, on the other hand, or, or, or by the same token, if you will, uh, issues like uh, traceability of the products, wanting to know where your product was grown. Was it grown with a GMO seed or non-GMO seed? Did, did it use a lot of fertilizer? Did it use this amount of water? Those things become more important now post-COVID, I would say. Indeed, and, and uh, those examples are particularly personal to me as I change my habits and I know to many of our students. And one of the things that I hear often from our students is they are compelled by one or other of those issues. Perhaps they are particularly interested in the impact on our environment of our food systems today and they want to pursue a career um, in, because of that passion. Others are completely compelled by the nutritional and health aspects of food, food sourcing and food uh, production. So what advice would you have, perhaps as we wrap up our brief conversation, what advice would you have for students who are interested in the future of food and how we make more healthier food available in a more sustainable way to the global population? What would you recommend that they think about, consider, or pursue? Yeah, first of all, I will ask all of them to join us. This task will require all of us and, and will require a concerted effort by academia, governments, NGOs, you know, private companies, students, young people to join this industry. The, there, is a, there is a silver lining here, Rachel and students, which is technology. There is at the moment the confluence of physics and computing sciences and, and biology is will create a revolution in food that you will never that like you never seen before. Even today, startups for agri industries or food companies are getting more than twenty billion dollars per year in funding right now. So the startup area is is an incredibly hot sector for for this, and it's because of that confluence. And certainly, we won't be able to do that with the same people than before. So we need a more diverse population of people, and we need to attract into this industry biologists and medical doctors and veterinaries and agronomic uh, majors and, 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 and all kinds of people that have passion for the food system because we need to reinvent it. And we are in the process of that transformation and a lot is going on. So I don't think it's been a better time to do this. And maybe I end the way I started. Remember when I said when I was in 19 or 20, we were looking for these tiny particles that were electrons to save us into the productivity area. I think now I will be looking for another tiny part particles. I will be looking for microbial solutions and microbial world to think how do we reproduce this world that we have today in a way that increases the carrying capacity of our planet. And I think that's the challenge of our generation. And, and I'm delighted that all the Enactus students are have passion for this because we need all of you. Well, you certainly shared your personal passion for it, and I agree with you. These next generation leaders of Enactus are very passionate about this, both personally, but also as you spoke to at scale. And so I do indeed suspect many of them will be inspired by your words today. We're grateful you joined. I suspect many of them will be seeking uh, a career with the ADM, given the passion and vision you've shared with us. We're grateful you could join us, and we look forward to the next time we're in touch. It was a pleasure, Rachel, and best success in, in, in your event and, and, and your future. 
Well, as I said, it was a pleasure and an honor to speak with Juan earlier, but we're especially honored today by uh, the three people I'm about to introduce who have made time to join us live. Today, we have Sanjeev Krishna, the Managing Director of S2G Ventures, Mauricio America and Global Malnutrition Partnerships at DSM, and Case Kraita. Chair and CEO of the Live Kindly Company, as well as Chair of the Enactus Board of Directors. Thank you all for being with us. As you know, our audience consists today of business, academic, and student leaders, and we'll welcome their questions throughout this discussion. But before we do so, let's start with some fundamentals. Underlying assumptions that have been placed in many, for many decades have been challenged in light of the pandemic. We're looking forward together at a future where we'll need to feed 9 billion people, as we discussed earlier with Juan, and recent events have convened to highlight the intersection of human health and that of the planet. So let's start first with a pre-pandemic view, and perhaps, Case, I'll start with you. So pre-pandemic, you were already uh, working on issues related to food and food systems. How would you have described the future of food systems to adequately meet the needs of the world pre-pandemic. And I know it's hard to go back uh, seven months to remember our perspective. It has changed so rapidly since then. Yeah, thank you, uh, Rachel. And uh, indeed, you're absolutely right. You know, of course, uh, we will all talk about the pandemic and uh, how uh, the health um, issue uh, should not have become uh, a food safety issue, but let's go back to before uh, that moment, because basically the food system was already uh, broken and you saw many of the elements which needs to be done to be able to create a sustainable food system already before the pandemic. And I think is that the pandemic has only increased all the acceleration of uh, what is uh, so highly needed. So let's go back. The first one is that uh, the notion of feeding 7.7 .7 billion people now uh, is uh, already a big challenge. And we all know is that over 800 million people go to bed hungry, uh, that the waste of food is twice as much as uh, those who need uh, the food. And we also know is that basically an animal-based food system, uh, which uh, we have with a rising middle class and 7.7 .7 billion people actually creates a huge issue uh, for the totality of, uh, the, of the world. If you then add into the thinking, the notion around personal health uh, and individualization of food, at the same time, you know, closer food where consumers basically uh, want to have the food being made uh, close in the local farm. If you add all those trends together, you know, you really see is that this was already broken. And so just think about, you know, from animal to plant-based and, you know, Juan already talked about it. Uh, and uh, many, many of the students are looking at this and they know is that basically, uh, if you think about the animal uh, food system, is that 91% of the Amazon, the lungs of the world are being eaten literally by the fact is that uh, the cows and animal feed is being uh, taken into uh, account. A chicken, which used to be, you know, uh, a proper chicken, which is now full of antibiotics and, you know, uh, bad stuff in the chicken, not only gives you uh, and not the right health in there, but it actually also uh, uses more than 10 liters of water for each and every chicken. And if you look at that through the lens of Africa. So there is many elements where we fundamentally believe and see is that, you know, this does not add up. And that is, you know, where the sustainable development goals come. It is towards goal number two, zero hunger. It is about uh, life under the water. It is about uh, the health system of humans where we take out at the current far too much uh, sugar in the uh, in our uh, in in our food system and the big element actually is as simple as it is it is omd one meal a day for 7.7 .7 billion people to shift to a plant based food system and that in itself will create a carbon positive effect and indeed a better health 
for the over 7.7 billion uh, people, but especially, you know, because of affordable, better quality of protein in the total system. So Case, you've opened up many issues there uh, that I'd like to build on and, and perhaps Sanjeev, I'll turn to you because we started with Case's view um, that the system was broken as I think we can all accept prior to the pandemic, but now in light of the pandemic, uh, what are the greatest implications that you see as you look across both the food and the egg, egg sectors and how are you thinking of that uh, in light of where we are in this moment in time? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the themes he mentioned is critical. I think the way this crisis becomes a catastrophe, in my opinion, is if the food system breaks down. Um, and I think we think this actually accelerates the movement to a more healthy, sustainable food system. We, we think of four themes. One theme is digitalization. Um, agriculture is in the, and food is at the bottom three. Um, oddly, the other two are education and healthcare. All three are being affected by telemedicine, teleeducation, and we think eventually a food and access system will be more digitized faster as a result of this. The second theme is really around decentralization. Um, you know, I think globally everyone wants shorter supply chains. And I think that's going to, you know, from, from large grocers and food service to, to small um, mom and pop firms around the world. And I think that creates a great ability to, to create. Uh, more of a circular economy framework to the food system, um, both in protein, like plant-based protein, um, as well as other other forms of cell-based protein and other things, as well as produce in terms of vertical farming um, and, and indoor agriculture, a number of other implications around decentralization. The third thing that I think gets impacted quite a bit is decommodification. Um, we've had, in my opinion, a kind of a boring food system globally. I think 80% of the calories come from 20 um, sort of monocultures. And I think we're about to go through a golden age of biodiversity, which will, I think lead to more improvements in nutrition and flavor. Now, how you marry that decommodification with both deflation to the consumer, how that trust passes across the value chain, how you get farmers to plant new seeds every year, how that, then you get ingredient firms and brand firms to adopt new ingredients and now new technologies. That's not easy, but I do think um, for many reasons, we're going to have a decommoditized uh, tailwind, um, mainly because the global um, system of commodity agriculture is being challenged by lack of profit to the grower. And I think that's going to create some tailwind in addition to COVID. And the final thing, and I think um, Juan touched on this as well, is really food as immunity, food care. I mean, we've had kind of this divergence between healthcare spend and food spend. And we see an opportunity to build a better system with, with all four of those, uh, with food as immunity of food care. Um, again, none of these things are going to be easy. They were not easy pre-pandemic to change the food system. You have a lot of oligopoly and fragmentation in the system. But one thing that we did as a firm is look at pandemic economic history, Justinian plague, black plague, Spanish flu, Every single pandemic has led to an innovation cycle that Juan referenced as well. And we think that, you know, this is going to be a huge opportunity for, for, for folks in Enact, for the students of Enactus to start the next great companies. Because innovation is going to be critical, um, as Juan referenced. And every pandemic, one of the glass half full natures of it is innovation um, is often quite scaled uh, coming out of it. And Juan referenced a firm like ADM is very interested in, in that innovation. And I think many other market participants across the value chain um, are going to have innovation. So I see a real opportunity post-COVID to actually create more accelerants, unlike many other industries, to create a more sustainable and more healthy food system. Sanjeev, thank you for that framework. It's uh, fascinating to hear and especially uh, relevant to many of our students. As we know, when we look at the global goals and the framework that we use to evaluate and assess uh, where our students are focusing their efforts, nutrition, food, many of the issues that you, we have highlighted already are at the top of that list. And so Maurizio, as I turn to you, um, in your role in global malnutrition partnerships at DSM, I want to talk about an issue that is near and dear to many of our students' hearts, which is nutrition and access. Um, the global nutrition report recently revealed that the burden of global malnutrition still remains unacceptably high, but there were also areas of opportunity for us to get back on track. And 
Sanjeev, you just brought uh, the word innovation to the fore, which is what many of our students are driving. Maurizio, I'd love to hear from you where you see the greatest opportunities uh, for us to get back on track as a global community, especially uh, through the lens of innovation. Uh, thank you very much, Rachel, and then uh, hello to everybody from this beautiful country called Brazil. And thanks to the digital technology that uh, make this uh, possible for us to talk here. Very much appreciate it. Um, and then um, I, uh, I, um, I cannot uh, avoid start talking in what I call the uh, nutrition pandemic. Because uh, the, uh, the, uh, what COVID has brought these uh, tremendous challenges, I think Kes has already mentioned some of them, but uh, for instance, in, in the uh, increase in, in food uh, insecurity has increased dramatically. Uh, it's it's uh, almost doubling. We have 135 million people in and, uh, and 2019, and now we're going to reach 265 million people that are not secure if they have food. Also, the, the, the disruption in the supply chains has been quite amazing. Uh, if you think in West Africa, the prices, uh, the food prices have increased by 25%. So people cannot even afford at the level that it is, and that now it's, uh, it's very complicated. And on top of it, I think one of three people in Africa are malnourished today or have been malnourished in the last uh, two, three years. And um, we expect that because of COVID, um, this figure will double. So it, it is really, really a, a very challenging um, uh, situation for all of us to reach what has been mentioned already, the SDG number two of zero hunger in 2030. So um, I think I would like to offer perhaps, I mean, five elements that um, we uh, at the SM have been discussing and supporting uh, as the, uh, the, the major uh, vitamins producers in the world. We have a huge responsibility uh, and we don't shy away from that. I think it, it's, it's quite important for us that. So the first one is to safeguard access to nutritious and safe and affordable foods. So I think we have to do this in, in making sure that the uh, food producers, the retailers, the food processors, better saying the overall food chain needs to be safeguarded because it's, it's, we have seen it, uh, it has uh, strong signs of uh, being broken and with uh, the uh, uh, pandemic, it's even worse the situation. Number two, it's improved the material and childhood um, protection uh, for breastfeeding. So I think th this is something we have been talking about, but then again, we have to secure access to nutritious foods for mothers and then also for children. The third one, it's expand preventive and other nutritional services and programs, like for instance, uh, the distribution of micronutrient supplementation and not less important for children, the distribution of mega doses of vitamin A. Number four would be maintain the uh, provision and distribution of nutritious and safe school meals. We know that um, with the situation that we have now of the pandemic, people are, are the, the children in need, they are not only uh, away from education, but they are also away from the meals that they normally have the only one. And to promote, the last one, number five, is to promote the protection uh, of projects for that are really um, at the base of the pyramid. Now, the major question of all these five topics is who is supposed to do that? Who is responsible for that? And then I think, I mean, the name that comes to mind is collaboration. We cannot do this alone. I think the private sector has to go together with the NGOs, the GEOs, the academia, and the whole of the social, social, social uh, the, the civil society. We must do this. And how? I think by promoting, and innovation has already been, been uh, discussed here, but these disruptive, innovative models, food chain models, that are addressing these topics and promoting the public and private um, uh, um, joint the, the uh, developments, but the, the ones that are really, uh, that have proven an effective positive impact in the population. And as an example, and I can uh, build on that later or people can check, uh, Africa improved foods in Kigali, Rwanda. Thank you, Maurizio. It's a, the issue of collaboration and partnership is, you know, woven into the thread and the integrity of what we do at Enactus and students are asking those questions. So I might turn this back to Case, uh, to you. How do you think about 
the role of the Live Kindly Company, for example, as a part of that system. Tell us a little bit about the approach uh, that Live Kindly is taking um, and how that collaboration, in your view, will best advance progress. Yeah, you know uh, what we already uh, said, and uh, by the way, collaboration is an absolute uh, critical part of it. That's why uh, we are not uh, called the Live Kindly Company, but actually a Live Kindly Collective. And you know, what we want to create is a collective, a movement where people actually join the platform. Uh, and then, you know, this collective force will help to transform uh, a animal-based food system into a, a plant-based food system. And so uh, the collaboration of that is, uh, is at the heart of it. When you think back, you know, uh, what needs to happen is you need to create capacity and capability for a new food system to come. And in the last 30 years, what we have done, we have optimized within the system. We've tried to optimize within the system, but actually you need to optimize the total system. So don't work in the forest, work on the forest. And I think that is uh, the biggest uh, thing what we need to do. And uh, if you think about government's role uh, around, you know, subsidies versus real cost and getting a real cost into the system is a part of uh, that totality. Of course, when you think about uh, all the way upstream, uh, what needs to happen uh, in terms of uh, feedstock for enough quality uh, protein is absolutely uh, key. I think for uh, the students, many of you, you know, you uh, or at least I did not realize is that if you think about the total new value chain, you know, you need to cut out the middleman. Well, what happens with an animal to plant based uh, protein system is that the chicken is not where the uh, protein is coming from. It is from the actually the feed. And therefore, if you cut out the middleman, this time it is the chicken, you actually you go from immediately from plants into uh, plant based, which is uh, affordable uh, and good quality protein. So ultimately, uh, the big message here is that, you know, with a true uh, dedication of the need of a total system change, that is where collaboration will work. That is where innovation will be there. That is where scale will happen. And that is basically uh, how the total system uh, can, can uh, be optimized. And then at the end, you know, it's all about uh, the consumers uh, who will uh, shift and uh, create the shift. And that is where, you know, all the inactive students uh, come in because the Generation Z, uh, the millennials, uh, you already know exactly what it is. And you will look back and say, uh, 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 to those times, why were we eating animals? Because whilst we were eating animals, we were eating the planet. And actually, there is a much better way to be able to uh, to do this uh, in a more sustainable way. So it's exactly uh, what uh, Sanjeev and what Mauricio say. It is about collaboration, it's about innovation, and it is creating a total new system uh, instead of optimizing within the old system. So uh, Sanjeev, I'm curious about your perspective here because you work with many uh, young, entrepreneurial, innovative uh, uh, startups. Talk to me a little bit about how uh, you advise and work with them as they think about their role in the greater system. Yeah, I, I, I do think the power of entrepreneurship and innovation has never been more um, compelling. You know, we've democratized a lot of um, computation and a lot of the toolkits that you need to innovate. And where you want to innovate is your choice. You can innovate in many sectors. In fintech, you can innovate in healthcare. I think the reason I think the food system is really a compelling place to, to start businesses and, and to invest your time um, and raise capital and be an entrepreneur is, you know, the food system is pretty unique industry. Though. It's one of the few industries that can actually sequester carbon, we believe. Um, there's a lot of co-benefits to that as well in terms of water, uh, soil health, a number of other things. You, know, you don't fully believe every single carbon sequestration academic debate, but it's certainly part of the system. And the second thing is you've got two big contingent liabilities that are on the balance sheets of, of, of every country and every citizen in the world. One is climate change. The other is healthcare. No other industry can have a positive impact on both those things. Um, the second thing is everyone eats. 
I mean, I think of those probably, I would imagine if I was 19 or 20 or 21 today, not probably an activist folks, a very resilient entrepreneurial, but there's some anxiety of what will you want to go um, given, you know, what's happening in the pandemic. And I will tell you the our portfolio, our, our sector is still growing. It's one of the few industries that's, I think, both recession proof and in certain cases, pandemic proof. Now, food service is an issue. Certain sort of old line industries that, you know, um, uh, have issues around labor and other things like, you know, I think have faced issues. Um, but I do think that there is a nature, a defensive nature of this sector. Now, is it going to be easy? No, nothing worth this sort of uh, impact is. Are there frictions? Absolutely. Is it going to take a long time? Yes. But I totally believe in everyone that said today, we've never been in a better time to kind of build it back better. Um, we, there, the All of the toolkits are there. Um, the global, the future of the global commodity food system that's been monoculture based, the the lack of cash flow and profitability to, to many farmers in that system, particularly in the in North America but other places, are going to create re- huge openness to change from a farmer perspective. Channel, the channels to market, um, there are going to be alternatives to the traditional model. I believe um, that may allow greater adoption. Emerging brands, there's 65 categories in a grocery store in America. In pre-COVID, 62 of them, the incumbent was losing market share. So there's, there's a whole wave of emerging brands that have new different supply chains, that have different ethos. The biggest thing that I'm most excited about, I think that gets talked about the least, is if you look at the last 25 years, after every industry, what someone in my position, we, we say disruption is a cliche, and I say it a lot. Um, but the, the single biggest arc coefficient to, to disruption is channel digitalization. So music and Spotify, video and Netflix, consumer batteries and Amazon. E-grocery and, and how food gets digitized is just starting. In the U.S., it's, I think, going to go from probably 5 to 8% to north of, you know, people think 20 25%. That fundamentally has changed many industries in terms of how startups it democratizes producers and sellers. And I think as that continues in the U.S. and globally, I think startups really can, can benefit from that, from either a DDC model or just less friction from, you know, a dem- more democratized access to, 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 to the marketplace. So I'm very um, encouraging of our founders to continue to try to find ways to, to do go to market. Um, to, to build scale. And I think this is an industry that actually is set up for, you know, m- much better than many other industries post pandemic. So that's a very encouraging and hopeful message. I think that you've all underscored, which is opportunity. So I'm going to make this very practical and personal for many of our students. Many of them, as you know, as I shared, are working in this arena, whether it's with small producers to increase yields, more effectively produce, Um, or other areas. And for those who are compelled uh, to work in this field, what advice would you give them at this time, this time of ripe opportunity and rapid change? Maurizio, I'll start with you. Yeah, it's it's, uh, already proven that um, when the humankind is uh, at the edge of the cliff, uh, they start to rethink the way that uh, in all the processes and how, how we, we can um, uh, operate in the future. And this is what is happening now. And from that perspective, we count on, on this generation, all the students that are um, today uh, being part of an actus. I mean, you need to play an important role into rebuilding this world in a better place, not only for you, for us, but also for the generations to come. And I think if I could do an, any an advice, look, if it's so we, as easy as the World Bank has said, every door that you put into nutrition, it represents a positive impact in the uh, whole community of 35. So I think there is no doubt that we need people with very creative, innovative um, ideas in order to make the, uh, uh, the overall food system work again and work better than we have before. So three, three recommendations from my side. First First of all, be proactive. Uh, do not wait for the opportunities to knock your door. Go after the opportunities. Please do that. Number two, be curious. I think curiosity is quite important. Um, if, the more you ask, the more you get to know. And I think that is uh, quite an exercise that uh, needs to be played if you want to be innovative. And number three, uh, be resilient. There has been and there will be a lot of challenges, but do not give up 
uh, uh, every time that you see the first uh, the first issue in front of you. And we need this. We need these three. But everything done with tremendous passion. Passion for the food system, passion for nutrition. And this will be uh, my advice. And um, if you um, really want to join um, an opportunity and a great company, come to DSM because we enable healthy diets together with our partners for all. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> well, I appreciate that very much. In case, uh, I'll turn it to you. Uh, what advice would you give? Uh, you know, I think uh, like an actress uh, always says, you know, uh, uh, it needs to have uh, a, a head for business and a heart uh, for uh, the world. And, you know, if you think about what uh, Mauricio just said, this is all about leadership. It's about how you think about uh, and really make sure that the private sector is a force for good. Uh, and that is uh, the, all uh, what, you're, uh, what you do. I would just add two more thoughts into it. Uh, one is about consciousness. And, you know, the moment that you see things, you will never unsee it. And I had uh, uh, moments in my life of consciousness uh, when I was still working for Unilever. And, you know, with virgin plastic, uh, there was something there which I just didn't see because it was in the system. It just was normal. And then you realize is that, you know, what we were doing uh, was just completely ridiculous. Once we saw that, we changed that in a way, is that you uh, totally changed the system. And so I think uh, the two uh, advices on top of Mauricio's leadership uh, uh, advice is about, one is about consciousness, and the second one is about ambition to change the total system and don't just work within the system. Thank you for that. And uh, Sanjeev, given an, as an investor and as a consumer, what would you uh, guide to our students? I think, yeah, I want to talk really and highlight the resilience point and the consciousness point. I think both are very important, but I would say three things. One, think long-term, but learn short-term. The marketplace is extremely humbling for everybody. Like if you're a CEO of a Fortune you know, 100 company or an entrepreneur, it's a very humbling place, especially the modern marketplace that changes so quickly and has so many sort of black swan events. Black swans are sort of just the new normal, I find. Um, and so I think learn, iterate, fail, learn, iterate, fail. So I also think long term. Two, I think it's, it's really around um, surround yourself with great talent if you're trying to build a, a startup. I think the way that I've always seen it is talent over technology um, is so critical. And I, and I keep getting humbled by that point as well. Um, and then the, the third thing and, and final thing, if you're in this sector is, is I think um, case was emerging, like you all have the power. Your generation, I think will transform many industries, many economies. I'm, every time I leave an activist meeting, I'm like more hopeful about the next generation as I've told Rachel. Um, and, and I think you have a, a, a case referred to as like, I saw a t-shirt um, like eat, like you give a, uh, let's say crap here, but, um, and I think you, you, you all have that power, every meal decision, every consumer decision. And I think what you all have been doing the last 10 years as a generation is to transform corporate boardrooms, has informed m and choices, has informed venture capital decisions. And so I think continue that advocacy that you all have for that, you know, that more positive world. Well, thank you all. Oh, we have just uh, scratched the surface of a robust discussion. I think more than anything, I leave uh, optimistic and encouraged and more excited actually for our students, many of whom, as I shared at the very beginning, are very focused on food access, food security and sustainability linked to production. Uh, and I know that that focus will continue, which is part of why I'm so excited to share that we will be launching a global challenge on this topic later this year with the founding support of the Live Kindly Collective. We will be sharing all of that detail with all 72,000 students and more around the world after an Actus World Cup 2020 ends. Uh, to each of our panelists, thank you very much for sharing your insight and your optimism about the future of food. We're honored to have hosted you today and confident uh, with our young leaders as they pursue their purpose in this area. Thank to you, Rachel. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Thank you, uh, Rachel. I just wanted to add is that we are super proud to, uh, you know, to support that. Uh, and I want to uh, say is that 
you know, this is all to make sure is that we, uh, with our audience, with our students uh, around the world, is that uh, we inspire to people to live kindly for humanity, our home, and those who share it with us. And so thank you for uh, the audience. Uh, back to Rachel. Well, thank you to all of you in case for your support. And if you work with an organization who's interested in joining us in that effort, we certainly welcome you as well. Um, along with Belicio Foods, another one of our sponsors and hosts of this Lead Change session, an organization that has created high quality food that has fed millions over the years and shares with us a passion for excellence and entrepreneurship as we look to feed a better, more sustainable world for all. And of course, to DSM, our friends, both in Brazil and around the world, uh, a global provider of nutrition, health, and energy, committed to bringing brighter lives and creating them by harnessing science and innovation to tackle some of the great challenges we've discussed here today. Again, thank you all for your support, your engagement, and to our audience, thank you for joining us.